um, and then hopefully by then our uh, our partners and and panel and fellow panelists will be uh, uh, available and and ready to jump in on on uh, their part of the presentation. Um, but so welcome everyone um, to the first in our summer series on uh, the, the Children's State Plan Amendment. Uh, it's a service by service walkthrough. Um, so without further ado, let's uh, let's jump in. But I would also just like to mention up front that the slides are now available uh, at mctac.org. Um, under the events page, you can click through and uh, and download those there, um, and then a recording of uh, of this event uh, will be made available available soon. So today we're going to be talking about other licensed practitioner um, again as part of our uh, children's state plan amendment uh, service by service overview series, uh, the state plan amendment which we'll be affectionately referring to as uh, SPA uh, from from here on out. So as uh, as, our, as our state partners are, are getting logged in and navigating some of the uh, the technical difficulties uh, with uh, with the platform, which always always seems to occur uh, at the worst possible times, never during the practice session, always uh, during the actual presentation. Um, just wanted to mention that today the lead presenters uh, will will hopefully and likely be Angela Keller, uh, who's the director of Children's Managed Care for the New York State Office of Mental Health, uh, and Mimi Weber who is uh, the director of the Bureau of Waiver Management uh, for the New York State Office of Children and Family Services. So just a couple of quick housekeeping and logistics notes. Um, again, I, 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 even though it's the beginning of a series, it's, it's likely that many of the folks on the line have uh, participated in uh, a MCTAC webinar before, or at the very least a different webinar offered on, on WebEx. So uh, with that, just a quick reminder that if you're interested in asking a question, you can use the chat option, please. Um, depending on what platform you're using, it's either the top right or the, the top or bottom right-hand side. There's a little chat bubble in the word chat. And we just ask that uh, when you send in questions, because we're located in different geographic locations, um, that you just send those in uh, to all panelists, please. Um, again, the slides are currently posted at mixpack.org if you'd like to take a look at those. Um, and then any questions that uh, we either don't have time or the answers for today uh, will, of course, be reviewed and incorporated into future training and resources. Uh, our goal is to be offering uh, this series on a weekly basis uh, over, over the coming month or so. Uh, so there will be lots of opportunities to ask follow-up questions, and we'd encourage folks to send in questions as they come up. We collect those, uh, take a brief, uh, you know, 30-second to one-minute pause at the very end. Uh, and then we'll, we'll launch into answering as many as we have time to get to. And just an important reminder that information and timelines are current as of uh, the date of the presentation. Um, so uh, the information that's being presented during the series is a summary and discussion of the draft SPA manual, uh, which is also currently available online uh, at the MCTAC web website and also in other places on the state's website. Um, so we encourage folks to, if you haven't already, please refer and review the manual um, for full and further detail, definitions, references, and other useful information. So our goals for today, very quickly, before uh, turning things over to our, uh, to our presenters, our lead presenters. Uh, so we'll be reviewing key information uh, from the SPA manual on Other Licensed Practitioner, or OLP. Um, along the way, be adding context and clarity uh, whenever possible. So again, please do send in your questions as we go. Um, and generating and answer questions is one of the main goals for this series. So making sure that uh, after reviewing and hearing about the information that's in the manual, that uh, folks are clear on what is and isn't known at this point is very, very important to us. Um, and then also uh, the goal is to help inform service provider decision making um, about obtaining SPA designation. A very important note to say up front is that the designation process is not yet finalized, but will be and announced soon. Um, so question, we'd encourage folks to hold their questions on the designation process um, because it will be a whole lot more information will be available. Um, but uh, we, are in, we are in discussion to get to add to this series, um, in addition to talking through the individual services, uh, presentation and opportunity uh, once the designation process uh, is is made available uh, to answer to review that process and answer any questions. So quickly, we'll be doing a SPA and Children's System Transformation refresher and update. 
uh, and a walkthrough of other licensed practitioner and the information that's currently available in the manual and a, a bit of context and, and nuance that we want to be sure to highlight to folks. Uh, upcoming training and available resources, and as we mentioned, uh, leaving time for Q&A at the end. So with that, uh, I'd, I'd like to turn it over to, uh, to our partners up in Albany, if uh, you guys have made it on and are all set. We are on, finally. Fantastic. Hi, Hopefully. Angela. Hello. Okay. Good afternoon. This is Angela Keller from the Office of Mental Health. Um, so I will cover about the first half of this and then turn it over to Mimi Weber from OCFS. We have other state partners on the phone. And like Dan said, um, you know, we encourage you to add your questions to the chat box to the panelists and hopefully we'll have time, even with starting late, um, time to address some of the questions folks might have. So um, what's ahead for New York State? children's system. So hopefully by now, um, everybody knows that the Children's Health Home launch will begin statewide on October 1st of this year. The care coordination provided through the health home is really a critical piece of the overall children's design and the transition to managed care. The second piece that will occur starting in January statewide is that we'll implement the new state plan services. So the other licensed practitioner, which is one of them and the one we will focus on today, um, is one of the six that will begin uh, in January. And then for New York City and Long Island in July of 2017 and January of 2018 for the rest of the state, the be existing behavioral health Medicaid services, the new spa services will transition to managed care. We'll also align the 1915C home and community-based uh, services that exist today in those waivers. Um, and the children who are in the care of voluntary foster care agencies will also transition to managed care on those same dates. So, where are we with the state plan? Um, hopefully, those of you on this call have had a chance since March to review the uh, provider manual for the SPA. We are still in the process of adding content to that, and that will be a work in progress, certainly, as we continue and, and begin our conversations with CMS. So as we have uh, substantial changes to that or additions to that, we will continue to re-release that so that people um, stay up to date. So the six new services are crisis intervention, other licensed practitioner, community psychiatric supports and treatment, psychosocial rehab, family peer support services, and youth peer support services. As Dan had already said, we're in the final revision stage of what our application and designation process would be and we anticipate being able to be uh, more articulate about that uh, very soon and uh, probably have another webinar just focused on the application designation process. We hope to release the draft SPA rates in fall of 2016. Um, and just for everybody's information, the state plan amendment uh, will be um, transmitted to CMS um, very soon, within the next uh, several business days, um, and then we can begin that process with CMS. So these ought to be familiar to you, uh, the children's design goals. So we've been looking all along at um, how do we identify needs earlier for children, maintain kids at home with supports and services, maintain them in the community, prevent the need for long-term or expensive services, and increase the delivery of services following trauma-informed care principles. And when early on in the, the process of the design, really looking at where, was, where were the gaps uh, and needs in the children's system overall, what were the things we wanted to keep, what were the things we wanted to build upon. So these new spa services hopefully will address some of the gaps that we've had for the general uh, Medicaid population. 
So you all should have seen uh, the manual, and each service has um, this list of components within the manual. So the service is defined, um, where can it be delivered, what's the modality, uh, the admission continued stay and discharge criteria, otherwise known as medical necessity, any limitations and exclusions. There will be more defined uh, billing guidance coming later with any uh, exclusions or um, billing specific uh, direction. What are the agency supervisor and practitioner qualifications, training requirements, and uh, where spelled out if there's staffing ratio or caseload size limits. Uh, that manual is available on the MCTAC website, um, and there's also a children's um, managed care website, and the link is towards the end of the slides, uh, that that's also posted and available. So the key points um, for the Medicaid state plan services is that they'll be available to all children Medicaid eligible under the age of 21 who meet that medical necessity criteria. We would like the services to be delivered in a culturally competent manner and be trauma informed. The way that this has been designed is it allows these interventions to be delivered in the community settings in which children and families live and really hopefully bolster uh, a lower intensity set of services to prevent the need for restrictive settings or higher intensity services. All of these six services fall under the early periodic screening diagnosis and treatment benefits. This is a federally mandated uh, set of benefits under a state's Medicaid plan. And so what that uh, indicates is for children who are in need of services to address uh, anything that's been identified on a screen or an uh, assessment, they ought to be able to receive that. Other key points include um, what's very different about these six new services is they are just that, standalone services. They are not programs. They are not intended to be programs. So what I think the, the field is often used to is a state agency would design a program, develop regulations, uh, designate providers, and uh, you know either license or certify, and then you need to set up that program according to the regulations. These are, are very different. It's a service and service delivery. Um, obviously, for any services delivered to children and youth, the family caregiver or legal guardian needs to be very intimately involved and active communication and coordination should be happening with them. Additionally, um, children are involved in multi-systems and coordination really needs to uh, be active with all systems that, that each particular child might be involved with. When these spa services are launched in January of 2017, they will initially be billed in Medicaid fee-for-service until we transition them to Medicaid managed care. Once they're transitioned to Medicaid managed care, any designated provider would then have a contract with managed care and bill through the managed care company. Um, we do hope to designate spa providers um, before the end of this calendar year so that plans have about a six month process for uh, contracting, credentialing, and claims testing with those designated spa providers uh, in anticipation of that July 1st, 2017 transition. So other highlights, uh, in New York State's definition around medical necessity, this includes uh, any treatment that corrects or ameliorates a chronic condition found through an EP. ST screening or addresses the prevention, diagnosis, or treatment of any health issues um, in order for that child to achieve age-appropriate growth and development um, and assist in their ability to attain, maintain, or regain functional capacity. So the way we've laid these out is that there will be admission criteria, so what needs to be demonstrated at uh, initial referral and intake to each of these services. Um, as time goes on, 
um, what is the criteria for continued stay or continued uh, delivery of a service, and when is it indicated that uh, discharge would be appropriate. So that's just a general overview. I'm now going to turn it over to uh, Mimi Weber to really go through specifically um, more about the other licensed practitioner service, which is one of the six. Thanks, Angela. So this is our, our new favorite slide because we're able to define for everybody what is, in fact, an other licensed practitioner. So an OLP is a Medicaid reimbursement authority to pay qualified non-physician licensed practitioners delivering community-based treatment services within the scope of their practice in a variety of settings. And those settings include the child's home and various community settings. It is similar to physician service authority in the New York State plan in that OLP does outline of the authority that, that practitioner type licensed under the state law and any prohibitions under Medicaid reimbursement. It's unlike the rehabilitation authority in the Medicaid state plan in that OLP authority does not outline every activity that Medicaid reimburses to non-physician licensed practitioners and instead only lists limitations. And as time goes on, that will become more clear to all of us. So who can provide other licensed practitioner services? A non-physician licensed behavioral health practitioner who is licensed in New York State includes the following, psychoanalysts, clinical social workers, marriage and family therapists, mental health counselors, masters of social work, of course working under the supervision of an LCSW, a licensed psychologist or a licensed psychiatrist. So what do other licensed practitioners do? So here are just some examples to give everybody a flavor of how exciting this, this new Medicaid reimbursement um, approach is for New York State. Other licensed practitioners can prescribe, diagnose, and or treat children up from zero to 21 with a physical or a mental illness or a substance abuse disorder or a functional limitation per the scope of their practice of their license. OLPs can conduct behavioral health assessments and evaluations. We certainly expect that OLPs will develop treatment plans, which will recommend services to meet the child's overall goals. And we expect that OLPs will be providing a series of family, individual, and group psychotherapy. What OLP is not? It's not a program, as Angela's mentioned. It's not an outpatient clinic service. It does not require a physical plant specification. It does, is, and nor is it a substitute for services that a school district would be obligated to provide under the law. OLP offers a great deal of opportunities for, for kids and families in New York State. It's an opportunity to engage a child and a family in a setting where they're comfortable. So we're taking the services outside of the four walls of a clinic or on any other structure and providing them in the home, community, or school. It's an opportunity for us to understand the child and family holistically and to remove barriers that traditionally impede office-based service delivery. So a little bit about the modality and settings. Um, so OLP services can be delivered to an individual or a family or a group. We would certainly expect there to be some commonalities across the groups. Services should be offered in settings that best suit the desired outcomes of the child and family. And again, including in the home or community. For school settings, there are going to be some limitations. We know that spa services can be provided in a school, assuming the school is, is also on board with that service being provided there, when it meets the child's medical necessity criteria. The need for school-based services need to be identified and documented in the child's treatment plan. And there would be increased access to behavioral health services for children who may or may not have an IEP. Here, so here's some examples to, to give everybody a sense of what, what we've been thinking about as we've been, been getting real jazzed up about OLP services. 
So here's a child who uses a, a wheelchair for mobility and is feeling isolated. He's unable to get to the clinic. The OLP provider can go into the child's home and provide psychotherapy. Or a child with a developmental disability is struggling with social skills and, and experiencing some anxiety. A marriage, a licensed marriage and family therapist might meet with the child and their family and the community to, to engage um, and, and provide some socialization skills. And our third example is a child is diagnosed with mild depression as a result of anxiety. And the, through an assessment and two therapy visits are provided within the home to assist the child with developmentally appropriate activities. So the service uh, manual that's on the MCTAC website will also provide further details and examples of what, of what we have in mind. So highly encouraging to check that out. So some limitations and exclusions. We don't expect OLP services to be provided to any more than six to eight members. We would expect OLP services would be limited for children who are on an inpatient basis. They'd have to be ordered by the child's physician. And as we're finalizing the rates and developing the, the billing manual, we'll see some more limitations and exclusions. So the treatment plan and notes. Uh, the treatment plan must specify the amount, duration, and the scope of the service and should be always delivered in a person-centered manner with participation of the child and family and any other providers involved in that child's life. We would want to reevaluate the child to determine whether services have, are contributing to the overall goals that the family and the child have identified. And we'd want to revise strategies and goals if necessary where we're not seeing measurable improvements. So the provider qualifications. Any practitioner providing behavioral health services must operate within a child-serving agency or the agency with children's behavioral health and health experience that is licensed, certified, or designated by DOH, OASIS, OCFS, or OMH in settings permissible by that designation. Children's Spa Provider Identification Process. So this is a little insight into the designation process that Angela referenced. And certainly a great more detail is going to be made available as, as quickly as we can get it out there. But providers must hold a license or certification or a designation by one of the four state agencies. We inverted the, the order here just to keep everybody on their toes. OMH, OASIS, OCFS, or DOH, and serve children. We certainly expect that we're, we'll be available to provide technical assistance to service providers who are either already Medicaid providers and we certainly expect that through, through introducing these six new state plan services that we'll be bringing on providers to, into the Medicaid system for the first time. Um, we recognize that for those providers that aren't already involved in billing Medicaid that we're gonna have to set up um, provider enrollment processes. And certainly training uh, will be available through, through the state agencies as well as MCTAC. The individual qualifications, um, we've already spoke about this, but let's, it's always good to, to reinforce it. So the non-physicians licensed behavioral health practitioners providing OLP services, other licensed practitioner services, include individuals who are employed by the designated agency, licensed in one or more of the allowable professions, and are able to practice independently. But able to, this is Angela, able to practice independently does not mean that that will be extended to practitioners that might be in private practice or uh, be providing services outside of the employment of a designated agency. So because we're designating agencies and not individuals, um, and so maybe we can make that language more clear in future future webinars, but it's the process is New York State will designate agencies who will then hire individuals to provide the service. Thanks, Angela, it's a great clarification. So some training requirements in addition to licensure OLP service providers that offer addiction services must demonstrate competency as defined by DOH, state law and regulations. OLP is an opportunity for us to fund evidence-based practices. 
Um, we, we acknowledge that the individuals that are qualified to provide OLP services might also be part of an evidence-based practice. Where that's the case, this is the funding stream that we'll utilize. So evidence-based practices require prior approval, designation, and fidelity reviews on an ongoing basis. And that'll be further spelled out in the in this program manual. A little, a little note here about evidence-based practices in terms of how we're looking at them and defining what is, in fact, an EBP. We've been looking at the Institute of Medicine's definition, um, and it's a combination of the following three factors. Best research evidence, best clinical experience, and consistent with patient values. Implemented interventions using evidence-based techniques may ameliorate targeted symptoms and or recover the person's capacity to cope with and or prevent symptoms manifestations. And as we said before, guidelines and instructions on how to become an EBP are forthcoming within the SPA provider manual. But one thing to note on the EBPs is that the state is really looking to designate providers that provide a, a model that is designed and developed, owned by a proprietor or developer. It is not intended to be uh, a best practice or a one-day training that a, a staff person might go out and get and obtain a certificate of completion at the end of the day, and, and then they would incorporate those practices into their normal activities. It's really when it's a model-based, uh, evidence-based practice that we're looking to designate and pay higher rates on. And we certainly recognize that there are lots of service providers out there that already provide evidence-based practices. Some are very familiar to us, FFT, MST, MTFC. Um, and so those are examples of ones that are known. We're, we're hoping that through this opportunity, we can expand the scope of evidence-based practices to kids zero to 21 across New York State. So a note about standards of care. Uh, the state agencies are developing joint standards of care for the designated OLP providers, regardless of the population focus. The standards of care that we're currently drafting will be incorporated as soon as we possibly can within the SPA service manual. Um, and we're developing a common monitoring tool. So the designation process um, will occur at the New York State level, and through the designation process, um, the, it will be determined which agency will hold ongoing monitoring responsibilities for that individual service provider. Regardless of who becomes the monitoring agency, we're going to use a common approach to that monitoring. All right. Do you want to pick this up? Sure. Here, Angela? So as we've talked about in, in this webinar and certainly in MRT webinars that are open to the public. We are very much still in design on some aspects of this. Um, and some, the, some pieces of this are still to be finalized and announced. So this is a brief list. So again, as we keep saying, the provider designation criteria and process for the SPA services uh, is in development the OLP billing methodology and coding structure, medical necessity criteria, and any limited limitations uh, for OLP will be spelled out and added to the SPA service manual. Um, we will also be spelling out what we would expect a, a provider to do in terms of service documentation and what are, is the utilization management process, both as we're in fee-for-service and when we transition to Medicaid managed care. One thing to remember on the kids design is that there will always be children in the fee-for-service system even after the managed care transition occurs. Um, some children are excluded from enrolling in a Medicaid managed care plan, but all of the services that would be available in a plan would be available to a child eligible for Medicaid in the fee-for-service system. So let's talk a little bit about training and resources and things to come. Um, you all know that this is the first of six uh, trainings on the specific, um, each of the SPA services. 
as we've mentioned, we hope to add um, a webinar regarding the SPA designation process and uh, potentially another webinar um, on some learnings that have occurred uh, in different parts of the state where providers are testing out these SPA services in some form. Um, the state-led training on the CANS New York um, has been scheduled. These are um, in-person trainings. They do not replace the ability of a provider to go online to the canstraining.com website and be trained online and certified online, but we wanted to give people an opportunity to attend in person uh, in addition to what's already available online. There's no need to attend both. Uh, one is sufficient to be trained and certified. Very soon we will also be announcing a schedule for the training on the HCBS services uh, as we move uh, into the fall. So our plan has been um, that in these early summer months of June and July, we'll have a high-level service-by-service walkthrough, um, what the designation process will be, and um, depending on the timing, the billing rules and the overview uh, when that's available. In September, our hope is rates and billing codes, again, talking about staffing requirements, caseloads, medical necessity criteria more specifically, um, and help with uh, EHRs uh, and that sort of operations of, of these services. October, we'll talk about the referral process, documentation, um, reviewing the training and preparation that folks ought to be doing with staff that will provide the spa services, uh, any exclusions, how this will interact with Health Home, uh, who will be coordinating all services available to, to children, uh, what might be the reporting requirements, and then as we move uh, later in the year, anything more specifically on each of the services, um, and then uh, certainly for those that are, as we've said, those providers that are not currently Medicaid providers will be providing uh, probably webinars and, and more personalized technical assistance to get them into the Medicaid system. Um, and on January 1st, the SPA services will launch, um, and that's not the end of continuing support and technical assistance. So there's a great deal of uh, resources and information that are out there. There are uh, mailboxes in which questions can be sent to uh, at OMH, OASAS, OCFS, and at DOH regarding the children's health homes. At the bottom of the slide, you'll see the link for the children's managed care design. So as we've revised documents, uh, also historical documents are on there, any uh, MRT subcommittee meetings slides, we've uh, released um, a whole host of information as it can be located there. So we're now at the point of our webinar um, that hopefully we've gotten some questions, um, but certainly after this webinar, if you have questions, as you see, uh, MCPAC is always available to field those and we'll get them to the state agencies as relevant. Great, thanks so much Angela and Mimi for a really fantastic walkthrough of uh, the material around OLP. Um, so we we'll just uh, echo Angela and encourage folks to chat in their questions if they haven't already. Uh, we're collecting them here and uh, we'll, be, we'll be reviewing them. Uh, we've, we've got a, a, a decent chunk of time to uh, go through whatever questions might be coming to folks' minds specifically about OLP, SPA, um, but again, just a reminder that Anything about the designation process is, is still to come, um, so we'll be, we'll be re revisiting that in the, in the coming weeks. So one question off the top that uh, we'll, we'll take a first stab at as, uh, as our partners up in Albany are taking a look at some of the questions that came through um, is about psychologists. 
and if they can also be considered under under OLP. Um, and so I'd, I'd refer back to, uh, let's see if I can get there pretty easily in the slides. Uh, I it's slide. Uh -huh. slide 17, you can provide other licensed practitioners. Um, and then and again, later in the, in the presentation, uh, when we outlined uh, the requirements or who would be considered for this. Um, and so just to, Dan, just to reiterate. If I can just add, a psychologist is already covered in, in uh, other parts of the state plan amendment. Um, so they do have the ability to um, already provide services when the, within the scope of their license. The, okay. the intent of, of this amendment to the state plan was to include those that might not um, be able to uh, get off ground, get into the community, and be uh, reimbursed through Medicaid for that. And under this service, am I understanding correctly um, that the same criteria would apply to psychologists? Um, that they would have to be employed by a designated agency, licensed in one or more of the allowable professions, obviously, um, and able to practice independently? Um, they're, what they're allowed and not allowed to do would be defined in, in sections of the state plan where they are authorized. Um, they do not, I, I am not sure if they have to be part of a designated agency or not. I don't believe they do. but that could be uh, a question we can look further into and get back to people. So there's also a question that I'd, I'd send over to you guys um, about agencies who are not licensed Article 31s, um, and it has to do with designation. So if you wanted to, uh, to, to pass this one for a, a later conversation or a presentation. Um, no, we'd like to take that right on, Dan. Perfect. So um, this opportunity to become an OLP provider um, goes well beyond the scope of Article 31 clinics. Um, we are saying that any organization that is licensed, designated, or somehow funded by DOH, OMH, OCFS, or OASIS has the opportunity to become designated as an OLP provider. question about evidence-based practice and if uh, EBP is required for OLP designation. Actually, where um, that requirement would be is uh, required to be designated as a community psychiatric support and treatment provider, um, but there's a recognition that a licensed provider may bill under OLP and unlicensed under CPST for an evidence-based practice. But we'll get more into that with uh, billing instruction and when we get to CPST. And I believe there was a, there was a comment and feedback process that uh, occurred prior to the issue of the draft manual. Um, so another question that came through is, will there be uh, another comment period before the, the manual is finalized? Um, I'll, I'll take a stab at that, Dan. I mean, I, I think our approach has been all along that we want as much feedback into this, uh, into these services as we can possibly obtain. We want to identify areas of confusion. We certainly want to make sure that we're not imposing barriers to implementing these services. So we will um, make every effort to keep the comment period open for the manual. Um, at some point, though, there will come a time when the manual um, will have to cut it off, in essence, and, and sort of live with it for a period of time. Mm -hmm. I saw a question, Dan, that asked if a child needed to be enrolled in a health home in order to access this state new, newly intended state plan service or any of the other state plan services. And the answer to that is, is no. Um, these services are available to any child in receipt of Medicaid as long as they meet the medical necessity criteria. Medical necessity criteria does not include being part of a health home. Okay, and we've gotten several questions on who can refer a child for the state plan services. 
and it needs to be a licensed practitioner of the healing arts. Mm -hmm. And that is defined in the uh, spa service manual. So that includes a pediatrician, um, a licensed psychologist at a school, a uh, licensed clinical social worker, and a variety of other uh, licensed professionals in New York. It's another question. Uh, came in, are LMSWs able to provide services without LCSW oversight? And I'll only just pick that one up because it's the slide that's currently up there, um, that an LMSW can only provide under the supervision or direction of an LCSW, uh, a licensed that psychologist or a licensed psychiatrist. That is correct. And that is consistent with state education department uh, law and how a licensed master social worker uh, does have different uh, requirements and limits than a licensed clinical social worker. And then a question about settings. Will OLP services in offices be allowed? It is, it is an option. It's not precluded, but its uh, primary intent is for um, delivery of service to be out in the community. But certainly there are, are going to be um, times when it's appropriate, it's comfortable to the family, that that could occur. Dan, I see a question that, um, that Virginia is asking about whether or not OLP could be used to help assess um, for complex trauma. Um, and I think there's a slide that we talked about that, that describes the activities of the OLP, and that includes assessing, evaluating, um, and diagnosing kids. And so absolutely we would expect um, that OLP could help determine whether a child meets the criteria of complex trauma and therefore potentially eligible for health home services. There's a question specific to nurse practitioners. Um, so can nurse practitioners uh, considered NP other licensed practitioners? That's a great question, and so we talk about non-physician. I think we need to take it back and see if that non-physician includes nurse practitioners. They're covered in other parts of the state plan, same with physician assistants, uh, et cetera. So um, we'll have to get back on that question. Thanks again to everyone for submitting their questions and uh, for your patience as we as we make our way through. Um, we are gonna we have time for a, a few more questions before we wrap up today. So if, uh, if if you've got anything else coming to mind, please feel free to send those in. And just a reminder to please send uh, using the chat box and to all panelists. So Dan, if we can take another question, um, can OLPs be subcontractors with child caring agencies? or does it have to be an official employer-employee relationship? They, OLPs need to be an employee of an agency. Um, let's see. So under the activities slide that I think Mimi had just referred to, um, and see if I can pull that up really quickly. Uh, what can an OLP do? Um, can you clarify about the word prescribe? So based on a uh, licensed practitioner of the healing arts um, ability within the scope of their license and practice in the state, um, can they refer, prescribe based on their professional assessment assessment that a child might need one of these six services, that is prescribed. But again, it has to be consistent with, um, you know, within the scope of their practice. And there's a clarif question, clarification question about is OLP a service you bill under or a designation needed? Um, and my understanding is that uh, when designation, when the designation process happens, um, agencies will be asked to indicate which services um, 
they are interested and able to provide when the services go live. Correct. And if one of those five licensed uh, professionals that might be an employee of that agency goes out and delivers services within the scope of their practice, that agency would then bill OLP on behalf of the work that that, that individual did. Just to add on to that, there will be a series of specific rate codes that are designated for OLP services that they would use to do that. Does this, one question, does this mean that a therapist in an agency can refer to an OLP in the same agency? Yes. With spa services, we, there are not requirements regarding conflict of interest or conflict free, which as you all know, exists in relation to care management and uh, other parts of federal authority. So the question is, uh, another question is that uh, an agency can currently provides an EBP to children and adults, how exactly will they be considered uh, an EBP approved by the state? Um, we released previously a draft evidence-based practice designation process. Uh, it should be posted on the Children's Managed Care website in draft. That will give you some sense of how uh, we intend for designation of an evidence-based practice to occur. Uh, that will again be part of the webinar to come around SPA designation because it's really embedded within CPST. So another question is, uh, someone's currently designated as an adult behavioral health HCBS provider, there, hang on, my question moved. They're an LMHC. What about the other question about an yeah. agency's licensed as an Article 16 with extensive experience working with children? Can they apply? Um, certainly, if that provider meets the qualifications, they, they may apply to provide these services to this, uh, this population. So let me get back to that other question. So someone is currently an adult behavioral health HCBS provider. They're uh, a licensed mental health counselor, um, and they're designated for adult CPST, psychosocial rehab, and habilitation services. And so the question is, will they be able to be a child behavioral health HCBS designated? So the HCBS uh, provider designation process will be talked about at a later date. Um, if any provider meets, whether it's the SPA qualifications uh, or the children's HCBS qualifications, they may be de designated if they meet those and request that designation. And again, more specific billing information will be available uh, as we get closer and closer to implementation of SPA and others. But one question that came through is, if an other licensed practitioner provides a CPST service, would that be billed under OLP or CPST? Um, that we're still working out, and we will. Uh, that will be spelled out in uh, building guidelines. And a question just came in uh, about the child behavior health HCBS application process. Um, and going back to the updated time, time frame, timeline, um, the implementation of kids HCBS um, isn't anticipated until July 1st, 2017. Um, so the application process for that would, in theory, uh, get underway approximately when? 
Um, what I would say to people is that we will be sending out an update on the Children's Managed Care Listserv tomorrow, so look for some more information uh, related to a number of different issues. And with that, we're going to have to come on that. Yeah, that's great. We'll, we'll leave everybody on the edge of, uh, edge of their seats in the meantime. Uh, thanks so much again to Angela, Mimi, and the, the host of state staff and partners uh, that are up there with you guys uh, helping to answer some of the questions as they came in. Um, and uh, so next Thursday, uh, we'll be continuing the series, um, taking a look at psychosocial rehab um, and continuing with questions. If you do have questions specific about OLP or SPA more broadly, um, that you didn't have a chance to ask or we didn't have a chance to answer um, or that come to mind in the middle of the night and you just uh, want to get to it before next week, please feel free to email that over to us. Um, again, the email for that is on the current slide, mictac.info at nyu.edu, and we'll be sure to incorporate it into uh, our next presentation. So thanks again, everyone, and uh, look forward to chatting next week. Thanks, Dan.